and the first public radio station in the nation, KPFA. Good afternoon. It's 2.30 p.m. here at KPFA, KPFB in Berkeley, KFCF in Fresno, and online at kpfa.org. Up next, Pushing Limits. It's good to be mindful about how we refer to other human beings. You can't obtain harmony and peace if you're constantly using language that offends somebody. That was Suzanne Levine speaking about words of respect and disability. She is founder of the National Center on Disability and Journalism. We'll hear more from her on this topic coming up on Pushing Limits right after these news items. In response to Governor Schwarzenegger's recent across-the-board vetoes of bipartisan legislation written to protect and enhance California's in-home support services program, IHSS, home care recipients and their supporters gathered together in counties up and down the state to denounce the vetoes and call for renewed commitment to protecting home care. Luis Cardinon of In-Home Support Services Public Authority of San Francisco speaks about the rally and the legislation. There were a lot of consumers from the Chinese community, and we had really good speakers, people that knew about IHSS, use IHSS and wanted to be there and were very articulate about it. Governor Schwarzenegger and his administration, he cannot just veto six IHSS bills at the state without hearing our voices. He vetoed six bills that would cost little or no money to the state but would greatly improve the lives of people with disabilities um, and seniors that use IHSS services. It is legislation supported by both Democrats and Republicans. It is legislation that would have provided additional training for home care workers, assisted rural counties in making home care available to their residents, provided background checks for new workers, and would have made it possible for low-income individuals to purchase home care services through IHSS. The Metropolitan Transportation Commission granted $2 million to the Ed Roberts campus at the Ashby Avenue BART station in Berkeley. The campus is described as a transit-oriented center with offices of nonprofit disability organization and all accessible resources. Dimitri Belcher talks about the grant and what it means for the campus. I'm the president of the board of the Ed Roberts campus, and I'm also the executive director of the Center for Accessible Technology, which is one of the seven Ed Roberts campus partners. You know, $2 million, it's the biggest grant they gave. What's important about this, I think, is it really shows that the Metropolitan Transit Commission really has an understanding and support of the disability community and really gets the connection between disability services and transit. And I think that's really largely due to Mayor Tom Bates and Representative Barbara Lee, who really worked hard to make this happen. The campus is named after the late Ed Roberts, who became the first student with severe disabilities to attend UC Berkeley after being disabled by polio at age 14. Ed Roberts was the father of the independent living movement. The project has been in the works for 11 years. A state law surrounding absentee ballots unfairly restricts the mentally disabled 
and strips those confined to mental hospitals of voting rights. In the suit, the Virginia Office for Protection and Advocacy takes aim at a state law. The law says that any person who is unable to go into the polls on the day of election because of physical disability or physical illness can vote via mail, absentee ballot. But the group says the law does not extend to those with mental disabilities or illnesses who cannot reach the polls because they are confined. It alleges the law violates the Federal Americans with Disabilities Act. The suit that was filed in U.S. District Court in Richmond, Virginia, seeks a revision to state law. Pussy Limits will continue to bring the latest on this suit. This has been Leeway Moore for Pussy Limits News. The right wing folks rant about politically correct this and politically correct that, as if they were never hurt by a taunt on a grade school playground. But many of us are hurt every day by words that stigmatize us and limit our dreams. People with disabilities want understanding and respect, not political correctness. But it is a complex task to communicate this to the public as we build a disability rights movement. Should we have different standards for journalists and other writers than we have for friends and neighbors? Does a fear about not having the perfect words sometimes stop us from reaching out to someone new? Hi. I'm Adrian Lobby, the asthmatic Amazon. I'm here with my co-host, depressed guy, Doyle Saylor. Hi there. Today we're interviewing Suzanne Levine, founder of the National Center on Disability and Journalism. She founded this in 1998 and has been its executive director ever since. Suzanne's a freelance photographer, has published in numerous books and magazines, and has taught video production at a rural self-help rehabilitation center in western Mexico. Among the excellent resources on the center's website is a style book with over 80 or so annotated words related to disability. It's a great website at ncdj.org. That's the initials for National Center on Disability and Journalism. Hey, welcome to Pushing Limits, Suzanne. Thank you. So, Suzanne, do you identify as a person with disability? Yes, I do. Um, I was born with my disability, and however, I wasn't really diagnosed until I was in my late 20s. But I was misdiagnosed with test anxiety as a child, which was rather funny. But um, I have dyslexia and other information processing disabilities. I'm a person with a a mood disorder, and uh, hidden disabilities are uh, sort of an issue for me. People don't recognize that I have a disability. So anyway, um, uh, with a hidden disability like that, uh, do you have any comments about that? Well, I can definitely identify with... People saying, well, you don't look disabled or passing judgment on me about if I'm actually a qualified individual with a disability. And it it can be frustrating at times. At times I also recognize I have privilege where I can pass and not have someone come up to me out of the blue and remind me that I have a disability and and, um, objectify me on that level. The question that comes up uh, when I'm talking to people about disability rights, we have a phrase, people with disabilities, because what we want to emphasize is that they're people first and they're disabled second. The public, oftentimes, when they hear things like that, uh, a special way of getting a point across, they'll hit the uh, politically correct button. Anyway, um, do you really think that uh, when we use this kind of language that we're oppressing disabled people? My personal opinion is I think every person and every group has a right to name themselves, and it's not up to somebody else to judge, especially from the outside of that group, to judge if they don't know how it feels to be labeled, then they don't want to be labeled. So I think that each group has its right to name itself, and it is a form of empowerment. I certainly understand the concept of uh, people with disabilities and putting the people first, and I also understand that there are... a group of people who have disabilities who want to be called disabled person because their disability is visible and they're making a statement. So I'm interested in this word crip and cripple. And when you're talking to people who are professional writers, such as journalists, 
obviously most of them will not use the word cripple anymore. It's like, you know, so clearly derogatory. But you will hear it used, like here's a, here's an example. The Palestinian economy has been crippled by the world cutting off support to Hamas. What do you think about that use of the word cripple? Journalists are constantly striving for accuracy, and they choose their words very carefully. I don't think cripple is an accurate term. It is a, it's not the definition. It's a, a metaphor, and I don't think it really belongs there. When I give guest lectures in the classroom, I'll explain about crip culture, that um, crippled is shortened to become crip. And I said, and it's used within certain circles. People refer to it and each other. But I do explain the concept of, for instance, super crip as well, which is a, a, a label that is used often to refer to someone who um, goes above and beyond to, quote, overcome their disability almost to the point of, like not having one, and accomplish great feats. I also explain that when you're reporting, you don't want to use this language because it's used within, within the circle of people who use it, and not every person who has a disability is comfortable with that term. So the Modern Language Association has banned this word from their computers. You can't even look it up and find the word cripple. Um, do you support that kind of thing? I think it should be in style books and it should be explained. Completely removing it from a book to me is inappropriate as well. I think that that the word should be in there and it should be explained as derogatory applying to a human being and not to apply it in other areas because of its inaccuracy. Do you find that feminists or women and uh, people of color are a little more receptive and understand this since we've all had our uh, use of words? I remember when we were fighting against the use of the generic <laughs> he. Do you find that that translates into disability speech? No. <laughs> oh, we <Me> love too. <laughs> honesty. <laughs> no, unfortunately. So, no. well, let me ask this. How much does it matter if you change a label? When I came up in school, we used remedial. Now they're used special education. But my experience in the classes is that the, the kids exactly have the same opinion of the people who are in those classes. I don't like to talk about disability as special, but I do talk about getting specific accommodations. I actually think it's important. Uh, it, it doesn't change the world all the time. It doesn't always change attitudes. But you take one step at a time. Life evolves and our views evolve. And we want to go from remedial to special. Then we go remedial to special. And it's the process of us naming ourselves and describing ourselves. And, of course, it's the attitude behind the words that make the difference. Absolutely. One of the things that I was thinking about as you were just uh, making your comments, Suzanne, was uh, what I see you doing here is you're trying to get our power out to these public institutions to help people better understand things. Is that what your job is here? Well, I see my job at National Center on Disability and Journalism is to educate journalists and educators and consequently students about the complexity of disability. We have three, we say we, there are three points to go through as giving a methodology to look at the sources of the people that you interview as your experts, to look at the angle of the story if it, or the tone, if it's a, uh, a hard-hitting news item versus a reinforced stereotype feel-good story. Verse, and then there's the issue of language. And all of that, I think it just leads to more accuracy in reporting. You're listening to Pushing Limits on KPFA and KPFB in Berkeley and KFCF in Fresno. Before we continue with Suzanne, let's listen to a poem by local poet Neil Marcus. His topic, like ours today, is language. So this poem is called Language by Neil Marcus. I met a man who was savagely twisted. He was incredibly disabled. He was so disabled, I don't know what he got out of life. And yet his eyes sparkled between grimaces. I admire his bravery. His speech was barely intelligible. In fact, it was unintelligible. He made a facial grimace with every word he spoke. His words seemed to gargle like partially empty drain pipe. His body was contorted like his speech. It was horribly contorted. 
It was painfully contorted. It was racked by spasms over which he had no control. He had a twisted frame. It was twisted by spasms. He was violently spastic. He was uncontrollably spastic, like some alien kind of dancing pretzel. It seemed he was hopelessly incurable. I saw no cure in sight. Doctors were totally mystified and offered no hope. They threw up their hands in hopelessness. His movements were uncontrollable, like a runaway train in the Swiss Alps. He was a complete invalid. Couldn't do a thing for himself. He was confined to a bed. He was confined to a wheelchair. He was confined to a house. He was homebound. He was imprisoned by his body. He was imprisoned by his house, and he could not drive a car. He was limited. His racked body, left paralyzed, doomed, cursed by deformity, deformed like a gnarled old oak tree, scarred for life, disfigured in all limbs, maimed, mauled, and a victim of fate. And yet, something drew me to him. I tend to think he was blessed. He was very special. Pure in spirit, innocent, and in his own way, beautiful. Perhaps he was chosen. I felt akin to him. And that was language by Neil Marcus. This is Doyle. I'm here with Adrian Lavi talking to Suzanne Levine on Pushing Limits, uh, KPFA's radio program on disability rights. Some people have uh, disabilities, so it's hard to understand them. Do we have a right to have our access to the radio speaking in whatever way we speak without being uh, put down? Oh, of course. And I think that regardless of your disability or how you might communicate, if you have a high-pitched, low-pitched voice, if you have difficulty in enunciation and other people understanding you, um, and you want to be on the radio, you have every right to be on the radio. And uh, sometimes because I have some auditory processing things that go along with the information processing disabilities, and sometimes it takes me a while to figure out somebody's pattern of speech. And so someone who has cerebral palsy, for instance, ma- does make it sometimes more difficult for me to understand. But I'm very clear of saying, I didn't get it, can you tell me again? Because I really want to listen to what that person has to say that what they're saying is important and I'm not going to pretend I I understood when I didn't. And sometimes another person has to come in and help make the clarification. And if that person goes on the radio, I think that if they want people like me and other people to understand them, then they need to think of a way perhaps to provide accommodations for those of us who need it to be able to understand because... I want to know, and if I can't because of either an accent or some other issue, it's frustrating for me as a listener. Yeah, I, th- I think this is really one of the places where speakers of English as a second language and disabled people have a lot in common in terms of being able to be understood and have a platform where people will take the time. It seems to me like a lot of these words often get played out on the playground, and some of the most destructive ones are maybe at the bus stop if you're an adult have to do with um, emotional disabilities, words like loony and nuts and crazy and you're, you're insane. And Would you just talk about what that's like? for? Uh, can, can I just add in, the, it's not just the playground, but, uh, you know, everybody calls Bush stupid and dumb and crazy. And uh, since I have those symptoms, you know, I feel like there's a mistake. Well... Regarding Bush, let me be perfectly clear. I do not support his political policies at all. Uh, I think his policies hurt other people. However, I think he acts very dyslexic to me. And when people sit there and talk about him being stupid, and Dan Quayle, remember Dan Quayle, how he could spell? When people would insult him, let me tell you, I I did not keep my mouth closed. You attack the politics, not the person. And I get infuriated. (laughs) (laughs) You go, girl. Uh, Because, again, it's a matter of accuracy. And every time somebody insults someone and says, oh, they're stupid because they misspelled something, they're insulting me. And I'm not a stupid person. And even if I was, I don't deserve to be treated poorly. Uh, And as far as... Um, okay, now I got all wrapped up in that. <laughs> what was the other So part? it just extend a bit into the emotional disabilities, crazy nuts. Oh, right. Insane. Well, again, I think we often use 
colloquial English like that unknowingly, and we use shortcuts to to try to convey an emotion, and there are better words for it. When you have way too much going on and you feel out of control, you can say, I feel out of control, <laughs> as opposed to, I feel crazy, or I feel nuts, or you're nuts for doing that, or um, you're stupid for doing that. I think that there are better word choices, and some people might think, oh, you're a little Miss PC for saying that. But on the recipient side, if I were a person who had some form of emotional disorder or depression or, or you know, I have friends who are, quote, labeled crazy, and it just, it, it's, it's upsetting to be called that when, in fact, they have that label and it creates a stereotype, again, of them not being a human being but instead just being this label. It's very painful, and I don't think people recognize that. The term blind is used like that, too. What, are you blind? Turn a blind eye? You're saying that someone, someone's being ignorant is what you're saying. So when you meet someone who's blind, you, you conjure up ignorance. And I think that goes for all these other terms as well. And I think it's, you know, what comes first, the chicken or the egg, the attitude or the language? Well, I think it's interactive. And I think you need to work on both sides of it. We need to, to educate the uh, public, and we also need to stand up for what our rights are. And um, it's very important that we address these issues. So I, I support what you're trying to do here. Can you give us, like, a, a good summary of what the goals are of this kind of word use? I think it's, it's good to be mindful about how we refer to other human beings. And to be mindful, in, and if we want to live in a caring society, we want to care about the people we're around, we don't want to walk on eggshells, but we want to be able to be respectful of other human beings. And, and, and you can't attain harmony and peace if you're constantly using language that offends somebody. And to describe something, how you're feeling at somebody else's expense. There are times where we'll all do it, but I think we all need to work towards caring about other people and choosing our words so that they're not offensive or degrading to another human being. Well, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for all your work in this area. Is there a way that people can reach you? The best way is on the web, uh, through the Internet. Again, our website is ncdj.org. There's a web form on there that they can use to email me directly or email me at Suzanne at ncdj.org. That's ncdj.org. I also want to mention we have tips for interviewing people with disabilities on our website. And uh, we're always looking to improve it and provide more information. So also we have that available if people like to comment on that. And for people to understand that we want to add things, but they go slowly because due to lack of resources, it takes a while to make changes. But that we're always interested in people's feedback and understand that we don't have everything there. And there's a lot of work to be done. Isn't that the truth? Yeah. And so we're going off to do a little of that work. This has been uh, the Asthmatic Amazon, Adrian Lobby. I'm here with depressed guy, Doyle Saylor, speaking to the executive director of the National Center on Disability and Journalism, Suzanne Levine. Thank you so much for coming to Pushing Limits, Suzanne. Thank, Thank you. you. Get your pens and pencils out. Here come the announcements. VSA Arts, an affiliate of the John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts, has announced a call for entries for the International Young Soloist Award. This award is open to instrumental or vocal musicians with disabilities. Those living in the U.S. must be under the age of 25. Musical ensembles of all types are eligible as well if the ensemble has at least one member who has a disability. 
Deadline for applicants is December 1st, 2006. To find out more about VSA Arts and this award, go to vsarts.org. The Association of University Centers on Disability, AUCD, will hold its annual meeting and conference October 29th through November 1st, 2006 in Washington, D.C. AUCD is a nonprofit that supports university centers of disability research and policy around the country. AUCD's mission is to advance policy and practice for those living with developmental disabilities and their families by promoting research at these university centers. Among other topics at this year's conference, there will be a symposium on ending violence against persons with disabilities. To find out more, go to AUCD.org. On November 26, 2006, in Washington, D.C., nonprofits, small businesses, corporations, and individuals from a cross section of industries that have demonstrated exemplary and innovative efforts to enhance the employment of people with disabilities will be honored at the fifth anniversary of the Secretary of Labor's New Freedom Initiative Awards. The event also provides an opportunity for the honorees to share best practices and experiences that will inspire their colleagues and peers to actively recruit and hire the more than 49.7 million Americans with disabilities. To learn more, go to www.dol.gov slash ODEP slash New Freedom. Throughout October, KQED Television is celebrating disability culture by airing a selection of programs about persons with disabilities. Documentaries and dramas include, among many others, Freedom Machines, A Look at Disability Through the Lens of Technology, Ray Charles, The Genius of Soul, and The Life and Work of Mark O'Brien, an account of the poet journalist who lived for four decades in an iron lung. All programs are on KQED Channel 9 unless otherwise noted. For a schedule of programs, go to kqed.org and click on TV. KQED also broadcasts five digital channels available to viewers with a digital receiver and in many areas to viewers with Comcast digital cable. Visit www.kqed.org org slash dtv for more information this has been michael hammer with the pushing limits announcements thanks to our guest suzanne levine jan santos edited the program today thanks to larry book calder safi wanarubi and amelia gonzalez for technical assistance thanks also to vanessa casper leroy moore and michael hammer and the entire pushing limits crew Pushing Limits is produced by a collective of people with disabilities. We welcome fresh voices and new ideas to bolster our efforts. We meet every other week at the Center for Independent Living in Berkeley. Contact us at 510-848-6767, extension 636, or by email at pushinglimits, all one word, at kpfa.org. Stay tuned for the open book segment of Cover to Cover. Our story, Sunday, October 22nd, 6.30 p.m. on KPFA, a gift for the community. Interviews with Mananakulintang Music Guru Usupai Kadar, Philippine Arts Commissioner Trixie Angeles Cruz, about Philippine culture, history, and artists, with a special live performance of jazz and blues by Ben Luis, Carlos Yelcita, and friends. 
the Harana guitar stylings of Florante Aguilar, Tapnach Bay Area Pinay DJ Zita and Jenny Syed. Yeah, Dagang 